everybody. Nice to see you all. Good morning for another couple minutes. Um, so I'm Joe Malley, um, one of the oncologists with the Norton Group, and um, I'll kick things off here. Um, thank you for coming uh, to our Updates in Hematology Bloodwork Symposium 2023. Uh, this is the fourth year, I think, now we've been doing this. A special thanks to Governor H. Nixon, Jr., and the Norton Healthcare Foundation for helping um, start this event back in 2019. Um, I'll be your moderator today, or at least one of them, with uh, Dr. Stevens and Dr. Champion, um, my co-program directors for this event. Uh, so we all express thank you for, for being here. Um, the Hematology Update Symposium is broken down into three programs, uh, all of which are for CME and CNE credits. Each program consists of about four to five 15-minute uh, sessions. Uh, presentations somewhere between 12 to 15 minutes with a five-minute Q&A section after that uh, for our virtual participants, which I'm not sure where the camera is for that, but hello. Um, please submit your questions during the conversation or during the presentations through the Zoom Q&A box. And then for all of us here in person, if you have questions at the end of each uh, presentation, uh, just raise your hand and one of the microphone runners will bring you that so the question can be captured both for the recording and for the folks online. Um, as is typical for sessions running ahead or behind, uh, we'll get back on track with some scheduled breaks uh, in between presentations and in between sessions. Um, just as a reminder, um, after today's event, you will receive an email uh, with an evaluation link to complete um, for your continuing education credit. So be on the lookout for that. Um, the Am I supposed to be advancing slides here yet? No? I'm good. All right. Um, the educational objectives for today are to describe state-of-the-art research in hematology, uh, discuss the latest treatment options for non-malignant and malignant hematologic disorders, and to identify some new modalities for diagnosis as well as um, treatment for non-malignant and malignant hematologic disorders. Um, I'm happy to introduce uh, our many subject matter experts, all of which come from either Norton Cancer Institute, the Norton Children's Cancer Institute, the CPA Laboratory, and uh, University of Louisville Health Brown Cancer Center. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, our first session, session 1A, titled Detecting Minimal Residual Disease in Multiple Myeloma. Um, this will be presented by Dr. Rebecca Christensen. Uh, Dr. Christensen is a native of Kentucky, graduated at the University of Louisville Medical School. Uh, she completed her transitional internship in anatomic, in anatomic pathology, clinical pathology residency at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego, uh, as well as a hematopathology fellowship at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. During her 11-year career in the Navy, Dr. Christensen uh, served as the assistant residency program director for the combined Army-Navy pathology residency, as well as the Director of Cytology at the National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. She currently staffs position at, position at CPA Laboratory and uh, serves as the Director of Flow Cytometry there. And so please help me welcome Dr. Christensen. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. I love going first and kind of kicking things off. Um, we're going to be talking about detecting minimal residual disease in multiple myeloma. I'm currently the head of flow cytometry at CPA Laboratory, and I have nothing to disclose. Uh, so what is minimal residual disease? The NCI Dictionary of Cancer Terms defines it as a very small number of cancer cells that remain in the body during or after treatment. We typically use this terminology in treating our leukemia and lymphoma patients. It requires highly sensitive laboratory methods to detect these small populations. And these, the presence or absence of these populations are often used to guide treatment decisions and provide prognostic information. But why test or why look for minimal residual disease in multiple myeloma? Well, what we've seen over the last two decades is better therapies evolve for our myeloma patients it, with complete response and stringent complete response being more readily achieved. However, many patients continue to relapse. 
and more sensitive tools have emerged in the laboratory to measure the depth of response of our therapies, as it is these small populations that remain in the, in the body that serve as a source of relapse for our myeloma patients. Oh. Um, so I had um, not prepared, I thought I'd remove the questions, but uh, I guess we're gonna poll the audience today. Um, I thought I might poll and see how many of you are actually using, whoop, nope, we're not. <laughs> oh, yes, we are. So uh, MRD analysis for myeloma in our laboratory is a very rare test order. So I thought it'd be interesting to see how many of you may already be using it in your patients. If you regularly utilize this test, please choose A. If you occasionally use it, choose B. If you seldom or rarely use it, choose C. Or if you've never used it, choose D. I'm not tall enough, really, to see the screen, um, so you'll have to struggle with me a little bit. So seldom or rarely used. Yes, that's my experience. We rarely see MRD analysis being requested in our lab. So we move to the next. Okay. So for those of you who have ordered MRD analysis in myeloma, or maybe for those of you who have considered it, why might you be testing? Is it to guide your treatment decision making? Uh, is it in the transplant setting only? Do you use it as a prognostic indicator, or is there maybe another reason that you might choose to use MRD analysis? Not sure. Well, I think that, that speaks to the fact, oh, we have one answer, okay, as a prognostic indicator. Um, so we'll move maybe to the next slide. The button's not working. All right, here we go. So, what we know about minimal residual disease and myeloma is that many studies have shown a relationship between complete response and progression-free survival and overall survival, and that the deeper the response beyond a complete response correlates in overall survival. In this study published in Blood 2008, investigators looked at a prospective analysis of the prognostic importance of MRD detection in um, MRD detection by flow cytometry in 295 newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients that were uniformly treated, thank you, with the Gen 2000 protocol uh, plus autologous stem cell transplant. MRD status was assessed at day 100 following autologous stem cell transplant. And as you can see on the diagram, on the screen, progression-free survival and overall survival were considered longer in patients who were MRD negative. The top row corresponds to all myeloma patients that were studied. The top, uh, to the left is the progression-free survival, and on the right you see overall survival, with the top curve uh, reflecting your MRD negative patients and the bottom curve corresponding to your MRD positive. In addition, those patients that were immunofixation negative and achieved a complete response were also evaluated. Of those, there were 147 patients, and they saw a similar prognostic differentiation. In the IFM 2009 study of upfront versus deferred autologous stem cell transplant after initial therapy with lenalidomide, bortezomab, and dexamethasone, MRD status was assessed by flow cytometry in all patients, and a subset of these patients were also evaluated by NGS. Patients who were able to achieve an MRD negative status by NGS had superior outcomes in progression-free survival and overall survival compared with MRD positive status. In addition, the study showed differences in outcomes between the different levels of sensitivity, with progression-free survival improving with each log reduction in MRD sensitivity, as depicted on the screen in front of you. So the top curve corresponds to the most sensitive method of uh, 10 to the minus 6, which was the NGS method used in the study, the bottom curve corresponding to the least sensitive method of 10 to the minus 4. So what I'd like to do is spend some time talking about how we can assess our myeloma patients for minimal residual disease. I'd like to spend the majority of the time talking about the different flow cytometry methods and comparing those, and then briefly discuss next generation sequencing at the end. So as many of you know, flow cytometry is a multi-parametric analysis of individual cells, or what we term events. It is used in the diagnosis of our patients, it provides prognostic information, it identifies therapeutic targets, and identifies residual disease. Fluorochrome-labeled antibodies are used to identify antigens on individual cells, and it's based on the principle that neoplastic cells, cells show deviations from normal patterns of antigen expression. 
So if you're using 10 fluorochrome labeled antibodies simultaneously on a single cell, you're essentially performing 10 color flow. And as I mentioned, the principle is based on the fact that different antigen expression patterns are seen in our normal plasma cell populations compared to our myeloma. Two of the most commonly used antigens in the laboratory to identify plasma cells are CD38 and CD138, which are brightly expressed. As opposed to our myeloma patients, we see variations in expression patterns of these antigens. CD45 is often positive in our normal plasma cells and may be negative or more often is negative in myeloma. CD19, CD27, and CD81 are moderately expressed in the large majority of normal plasma cells. However, minor subsets of normal plasma cells may be CD19 and or CD81 negative, and both of these antigens are generally negative or only dimly expressed in myeloma. CD20, which we typically associate with our B cell neoplasms, may also be aberrantly expressed in myeloma and is often correlated with the 1114 translocation. So as you can see, no specific individual antigen defines a neoplastic myeloma population. So when we look at conventional flow cytometry, this is generally going to be the least sensitive method for detecting minimal residual disease in myeloma. If you're performing four-color flow, you would expect a sensitivity of maybe 10 to the minus 4. And the biggest reason for conventional flow being the least sensitive is that generally fewer events are required in this analysis or fewer cells are evaluated. So if you consider a typical leukemia lymphoma panel in our laboratory, we may analyze maybe 50,000 events and achieve a sensitivity of 0.1%. If you look at the table to the right of the screen, you can see that as you increase the number of events, your sensitivity increases. So with 100,000 events, you might reach a sensitivity of 0.03%. But typically, to reach the sensitivities necessary for detecting MRD, you really need to be analyzing at least a million, two million, and even five million events. The other issue is that Conventional flow cytometry is um, heterogeneous amongst labs, and there is a lack of standardization. Ideal, additionally, leukemia lymphoma panels are, always, are not always optimized to detect very small plasma cell populations, and we do see suboptimal staining in patients receiving monoclonal antibody therapies, such as daratubumab. But lucky for us, there are published guidelines for as to how to detect minimal residual disease in myeloma. And this we're going to term multi-parameter next generation flow cytometry. So laboratories performing MRD analysis for myeloma at a minimum must be doing six color flow and preferably eight color. They must be looking at the simultaneous expression of CD38, CD45, 19, and 56 on an individual cell. They must be cautious to interpret different antigen expression profiles, particularly for those minor subsets that I mentioned that may be CD19 or CD81 negative. The lab must have the capacity to perform additional analysis and acquire many, many more events than they typically do. And they also must be able to simultaneously look at the expression of cytoplasmic kappa and lambda light chains to look for monoclonal plasma cell subsets. The report you receive should include information about the limit of detection as well as the lower limit of quantification of those neoplastic myeloma cells. It should include information as well about the normal as well as the myeloma plasma cell subset. And according to the International Myeloma Working Group MRD, or M International Myeloma Working Group criteria, flow MRD should have a minimum sensitivity of 1 to 10 to the 5th nucleated cells or higher, which is similar to that of NGS. Many methods have been published as to how best to achieve these results and detect MRD, two of the most common being the Euroflow method and the Memorial Sloan Kettering method. The Euroflow method uses a two-tube, eight-color analysis with the first tube including surface antigen expression and the second tube including the cytoplasmic kappa and lambda light chains. The Memorial Sloan Kettering method uses a single tube 10 color flow that also employs cytoplasmic kappa and lambda light chains. Our laboratory uses a model that mimics that of the Euroflow 2 tube method as we found this to be the most robust method. The benefits of flow cytometry is that it's fast. Typically you can achieve results within a few hours. It does carry a high level of sensitivity uh, and can meet the requirement of 10 to the minus fifth. It can easily distinguish between clonal as well as non-clonal plasma cell populations. Flow cytometry can also assess for the presence of hemodilution of the aspirate specimen, which is something NGS cannot do. And it can be used at any point in the patient therapy. No ID tracking or diagnostic specimen is necessary.
The biggest challenge for flow cytometry is that plasma cells can often be underrepresented in the sample, and one of the bigger reasons is because the plasma cells adhere to the marostroma, which may be present in the, marrow, in the aspirate particles. Um, we do see loss of CD138 positivity cells during our marrow processing, particularly marrows that have been exposed to prolonged cold or refrigeration, um, those that are aged. Um, those that have been exposed for prolonged periods of heparin as the cells redistribute CD138 in the cell surface. Um, so these are samples that need to be processed ideally within the first 24 hours and must be processed within 48 hours. They can't sit in your clinic or in your laboratory for long periods. One of the other challenges in our patients receiving monoclonal antibody therapies. In this diagram, we've depicted a surface of a myeloma cell with some of the more common antigens that our monoclonal antibody therapies are directed against, with daratumumab being the most common seen in our lab directed against CD CD38. CD138 is probably the second most commonly th seen thing in our lab. In this picture to the left of the screen, you can see our monoclonal antibody therapy depicted in red is bound to the CD38 antigen of the plasma cell, thereby blocking the fluorochrome labeled antibodies used in the flow cytometry study and therefore we would not be able to detect this plasma cell as CD38 positive. However, other antibodies such as the CD38 multi-epitope antibody can be utilized to overcome this blockade effect as it chooses alternate binding sites on the CD38 molecule, thereby being able to detect it by flow cytometry. So I thought it would be nice to show you an example of one of our myeloma patients in their MRD analysis. As you recall, as you go across the, to the right of the x-axis or up the y-axis, you gain positivity in the antigens. If you focus to the bottom left-hand side of the screen, you'll see that we've nicely highlighted our plasma cell population that is brightly CD138 positive and brightly CD38 multi-epitope positive. The neoplastic myeloma plasma cells are highlighted in red, and the normal plasma cells are highlighted in blue. If you move to the bottom right of the screen, you'll see that our normal plasma cells in blue are 19 positive and 56 negative, as expected, while our myeloma cells have shown aberrant loss of CD19 and are brightly 56 positive. If we move to our second tube of the analysis where we employ the cytoplasmic cap and lambda light chains, you can see again We've isolated our plasma cell population that is brightly 138 positive, and this time we've shown a cytoplasmic VS38 to help highlight that population. And if we look at the kappa lambda ratio as a whole, we see a normal kappa lambda ratio of 3 to 1. However, if we kind of tease out that myeloma subset that was 19 negative and 56 positive, we can see that all of our myeloma plasma cells are nicely monoclonal positive, kappa positive, while the Normal plasma cell subset shows polyclonal kappa and lambda light chain expression. The report would include the percentage of residual disease. It would also identify the total number of events that were necessary to identify this population, which we had to evaluate over a million events. Of those, 1,281 represented plasma cells, and of those, 72 events or cells were considered myeloma. So comparing that to next generation sequencing, which is an FDA approved for bone marrow analysis of um, minimal disease detection in myeloma. It has a high level of sensitivity of 10 to the minus 6. Um, it does require far fewer cells than that for flow with a minimum cell input of more than 100,000 cells. Immunoglobulin gene segments are amplified using consensus primers as listing in the test panel on the screen. Um, it does require a diagnostic specimen or clonality ID tests, followed by subsequent tracking or MRD testing. And it shows similar limitations as flow cytometry, such as marrow hemodilution or patchy marrow disease that may lead to false negative results. One argument that I hear frequently from clients is that next generation sequencing detects disease that flow cytometry cannot. And the um, article reference for this statement is um, quoted from the IFM 2009 study, which we spoke about earlier. And patients that were identified as MRD negative by flow were subsequently assessed by NGS. And what they found is that up to 40 to 50 percent of those MRD negative flow patients were actually MRD positive by NGS. What's important to understand that is in this study, the flow cytometry method used was a seven color strategy with a sensitivity of 10 to the minus four. And the conclusion the authors made was that a sensitive technique like NGS is able to predict progression-free survival in patients treated with modern approaches. In this study published in um, 
Leukemia in 2017, a next generation flow method was compared to conventional flow cytometry, and not surprisingly, they found many more MRD positive cases by the more sensitive next generation flow method, maybe up to 25% more. And all the discrepant cases were due to very low levels of disease that exceeded the sensitivity of the conventional flow method. They also compared the next generation flow method with next generation sequencing and found a high degree of concordance. And actually, the flow method detected more MRD positive cases than the NGS method. And in this diagram, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, there was one um, patient that was found to be NGS positive but negative by flow, and that was due to a very low level of disease that exceeded the sensitivity of the flow method. However, there were six MRD positive patients by flow that were negative by the NGS method, and the authors um, suggested that this discrepancy may be due to suboptimal annealing of NGS primers due to high levels of somatic hypermutation within the immunoglobulin gene, but that more study was necessary. This table compares both methods and talks about, highlights some of the points that we've discussed um, with next generation flow requiring no uh, diagnostic or baseline sample. Both methods show very high levels of sensitivity for detecting MRD. Flow does require more cells than the next generation sequencing method, um, and it also requires a fresh sample. NGS may be fresh or frozen. Um, merit, flow cytometry can assess for hemodilution, and the turnaround time is much faster than your NGS method. It may be more readily available for your patients. So what I'd like you to walk away with today is an understanding that next generation sequencing and next gener generation flow have a high degree of concordance, um, and that what it probably boils down to most likely is choice the availability of the testing for your patients versus what your practice or institutional preferences might be. But what I would like to emphasize to all of you is to remember to prior always prioritize the first pool of bone marrow aspirate regardless of the method chosen for all your MRD testing as subsequent aspirate specimens are subject to hemodilution. And that ends my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for uh, being here. We appreciate that. Um, th we have a Q&A session for just a few minutes. Um, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Christensen? Anything in the, um, the Q&A box on Zoom? I have a question for you. Um, do you anticipate, like, the, the sensitivity to 10 to the minus 6, like, over time, that drifting in the more sensitive direction or do you think that there's some sort of physiologic, you know, like correlate that, like below that, it's kind of irrelevant? Um, is that? Yes. So part of our validation studies for, for the laboratory investigation to detect these very high levels of sensitivity is that we take the um, background noise, is what we call it in flow cytometry. Um, and part of the validation is we compare uh, our studies of very low levels of disease with what we call our term blanks, or just like running water because you do have some background noise, and when you get to very, very low sensitivities, the number of events that you acquire that are actually meaningful become, you know, less, you become less confident in that detection. So yeah, you d there is a point that you reach that um, y you lose that level of confidence in what you're detecting is truly disease. Is yeah. that what you're asking? Yeah. Yes. Based on the current flow cytometers that I have, yes. <laughs> but who knows? I'm not an engineer or, you know, these high-level scientists that may come up with newer techniques. But, yeah. Super. Thank you. All right. Um, next up, we have Dr. Chow uh, with session 1B, updates in bone marrow transplant. Dr. John Chow. Uh, an assistant professor at the University of Louisville Hematologic Malignancy and Cellular Therapy Program. Uh, Dr. Chow completed his undergraduate studies at Baylor University in Waco, Texas, received his medical degree from the University of North Texas Health Science Center in Fort Worth, and then Dr. Chow completed his internal medicine residency in Texas as well at uh, University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. Uh, following that, Dr. Chow came here to uh, University of Louisville uh, where he did his hematology and oncology fellowship um, and then returned to work uh, at both South Texas VA Medical Center BMT and Sarah Cannon Methodist Hospital BMT programs 
also in Texas, but we are fortunate enough to have Dr. Chow back here in Louisville, now working as an assistant professor at the University of Louisville, as I mentioned, and we are happy to have him here to help us learn about some updates in bone marrow transplants. So thank you for being here, Dr. Chow. Uh, thank you for inviting me here to speak about transplant. And uh, this talk is uh, hopefully um, uh, not, too, uh, I made it not to be too complicated to basically start from uh, scratch. So uh, sit back and enjoy, hopefully. All right. Yeah. So no disclosures. So hopefully after finishing this talk, um, you guys will understand the different types of transplant. Uh, as my mentor used hematopoietic stem cell transplant rather than bone marrow, uh, the Hersic brothers. Um, so that's kind of rubbed off on me. Uh, identify what kind of hematological malignancies um, we use transplant for, and then also um, become, become familiarized with uh, the new, um, or yeah, the new um, uh, supportive cares really uh, for transplant. So transplant is here to stay. So transplant, um, basically, I think um, a group of smart people came up in the 1950s, uh, 1970s, um, using the concept of high dose therapy to treat certain cancers. And they found that they were able to cure um, these people or these patients, even though um, they may have uh, disease after um, normal doses. Uh, but what was uh, unfortunate back then was we didn't have very good supportive care. And as a result, um, patients that got high dose therapy didn't do very well because of the um, uh, toxicities of the regimen. Um, nevertheless, uh, the field didn't give up. And as we um, advance in our supportive care, uh, outcomes got better. Uh, this trend uh, shows that there's a, um, you know, two, ba two, two basic types of transplant. One's called autologous transplant, while it's called, one's called allogeneic, and we'll go into more details of that. But there's a curious little bump you see in the 90s, late 90s, where autologous transplant really took off, and then it dropped down uh, in the late 90s. And I believe that was probably because um, in the late 90s, uh, there was um, uh, autologous transplant were used for breast cancer. And uh, it was used for uh, breast cancer for several years. Unfortunately, results didn't really pan out, and that's where you see the dip. Uh, the other trend um, you could see over time, it's growing, uh, but because of the COVID uh, infection in the past two years, you see a little bump going down. Uh, but if you discount the past uh, 2019, 2020, uh, the trend is definitely still going up. Um, there are newer treatments, I think Dr. Malley and Dr. Stevens will be talking about, uh, that um, some people say competes with transplant, but I feel like it more works together with transplant. So the two biggest types, or the two major types of transplant are autologous versus allogeneic. And uh, autologous is when a patient gets their own blood cells back. Allogeneic was when you look for a donor. And there are a lot of donor um, sources. And um, out of those, the haplodonor is really the, um, I would say, the biggest advancement in the field within the past few years to allow more people to go through a transplant. And we'll explain that more. So firstly, autologous. So this is uh, all data from CIBMTR. They lag by about a year or two to, uh, to make these graphs. But for autologous transplants, the most common reasons uh, would be by far uh, multiple myeloma. Uh, the second would be uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, specifically large cell lymphoma. And the third most common uh, disease uh, that we use for auto transplant is Hodgkin. And this is a uh, graph basically showing the trend uh, for autologous transplant in your basically two biggest uh, types of disease processes. And you can see for Hodgkin, or non-Hodgkin, Hodgkin, the, the lymphomas, uh, that's kind of evened out and plateaued. It hasn't really increased very much. Uh, but for myeloma, um, it does uh, show a trend going uh, up, uh, except for the past two years. Um, and I think it's the COVID um, causing um, less procedures, including transplant. And so, um, so for myeloma, uh, the purpose of a autologous transplant is that 
Uh, once a patient gets partial response, or hopefully even better, as Dr. Christensen had just mentioned, uh, the better the response, uh, even MRD response, uh, negative MRD response, they get a, a better outcome. And so a myeloma autotransplant, the intent of the treatment is not to cure, because right now at least uh, myeloma is not deemed to be curable. Uh, but it's de deemed to be a palliative content, uh, intent, a consolidation therapy. Um, we know that for people that go through a transplant, um, they tend to have a longer remission, uh, and this is based on trials before, and there might be a suggestion uh, of uh, overall survival, but definitely a longer remission. And so in a disease where you can't cure, uh, the name of the game is to try to kick the can down the road as long as you can to give them the time um, to be uh, disease-free or low burden. Now for your lymphomas, uh, non-Hodgkin and Hodgkin, uh, the autologous transplant is actually a curative intent treatment. And for these people, uh, transplant is used as a second line consolidation. So for example, when Dr. Malley, Dr. Um, Stevens uh, treats a lymphoma patient at relapse, as long as they uh, have chemosensitive disease, and we define that by partial response or better, 50% reduction uh, in the size or, or SUV that's decreased, then we would assume that they may respond to the transplant. And the thinking is that if they are sensitive to normal doses of uh, salvage therapy, uh, we may be able to uh, cure 50% of those people using higher doses um, to overcome the inherent uh, chemo-resistant um, of the lymphoma. So just a quick uh, little, I guess, blurb about what the patient would go through, and uh, this is uh, uh, just, just, you know, when Dr. Stevens and Mally sends their patient, this is uh, kind of the uh, four to six weeks of what we're doing. Uh, so before we do a transplant, we test the patient to make sure they are um, healthy enough to do a transplant. So our main tests are uh, heart tests and lung tests to make sure their organs are fine. Uh, we do assess them to make sure that they are somewhat functional uh, in everyday living. Uh, once they pass these tests and it's confirmed that they have um, appropriate responses to their salvage therapy, uh, they then go through what we call the hematopoietic cell collection. This is an outpatient procedure that involves um, priming the bone marrow uh, to uh, make um, their stem cells to a point to where uh, they make so much stem cells that it comes out into the bloodstream. Uh, after four to five days of the uh, growth factor shots, uh, they get placed on a machine, a apheresis machine, very similar to a dialysis machine, uh, where the blood is spun down uh, by a centrifuge and the stem cells go into a bag and the rest of the blood goes into the patient. The patient is usually on the machine for four to five hours. Uh, afterwards, we count how much is in the bag. Um, for a normal transplant, we usually like to get at least two million cells. For lymphoma, we collect for one transplant uh, because if the first transplant doesn't work, there's no need to do another one. For uh, myeloma, we actually collect for two transplants uh, because um, people that go through the first one have a long duration of remission. We can consider repeating that process down the road, and so we, uh, we get money in the bank so we could use later if we need to. Um, once we finish the collection, uh, then we actually talk about the actual treatment. And so for treatment, uh, I think the main thing to uh, understand is that it is just good old-fashioned chemotherapy for lymphoma my and myeloma, uh, but it's at a very high dose. And so when you give these uh, what we call myeloablative doses of chemo, it basically wipes out the bone marrow. And we hope that in that process, it's also wiping out uh, the malignancy that may still be there. Uh, unfortunately, if you don't give stem cells back, uh, the patient will not have a bone marrow to make the appropriate cells, and, and so they would have complications from that. So that is why their cells are given after the chemo. It takes about two to three weeks for them to recover. Um, in the past, this was all done in the hospital, but nowadays uh, we try to uh, do some patients as an outpatient uh, to allow better recovery. I think um, when patients are at their home, uh, they have to go and get their own food, they have to walk around their house, they don't have a nurse basically servicing them, so it makes them move more, they eat their own food. Uh, our hospital food is horrible. Uh, I don't know about Norton, but uh, certainly uh, home food is better. And then it makes them also um, 
you know, just, I guess, rest better instead of having somebody check on their vitals every four hours, uh, they're ever able to get a little better rest. Um, but we do have the capability whenever the patients get sick, have uh, fevers in the middle of the night, then they would automatically get admitted for the uh, duration of their recovery afterwards. So the recovery process is, uh, like I say, about two to three weeks um, after their chemo. And then the post-transplant testing, usually um, two to three months afterwards, we would repeat all their uh, respective tests for their malignancy to see if we've uh, hopefully improved their, um, uh, their parameters in terms of scans or myeloma tests. So that is an auto-transplant. So um, for large, I didn't show the data for myeloma because myeloma, there, it's not considered a, a curative um, uh, treatment. Uh, so the next most common reason for an auto-transplant would be large cell lymphoma. And you can see that um, this is a rolling survival for people that do transplants. And you can see that the patients that go through transplant uh, compared to early 2000s, uh, their probability of surviving seems to be improving. And I, it's not a lot, but there is a little bit of um, uh, space between the lines. And I believe that that is just uh, better supportive care, um, including antibiotics um, and, and, um, and whatnot. So when a patient goes through an auto transplant, uh, this is a, uh, basically a graph uh, stating kind of the, what they will pass away from. So the first uh, 100 days of a transplant, uh, the mortality cause is usually related to the chemotoxicity. Um, whether that's organ failure, whether that's infections, um, very seldom, I would say, maybe a third, a quarter related to the disease. But by far after day 100, uh, people that don't survive their transplant, it's because of their um, uh, disease relapsing. And, and as a result, um, uh, newer therapies such as CAR T-cell and newer regimens um, uh, now provide some hope for those patients. So uh, looking back on the previous graph, we'll switch gears and talk about an allogeneic transplant. So by far, the most common reason somebody would do a transplant from a donor is uh, if they have acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, that is then followed by MDS, MPN, myelodysplastic syndrome, myeloproliferative neoplasm, and the third most common, uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. The, the uh, transplant trend, at least from 2000, related to, to these respective diseases, uh, also show a flatlining in most, but the AML, which is the top line and the most common reason for allo transplant, definitely uh, continues to trend upwards. Um, the uh, MDS MPN, likewise, uh, trending upwards, everything else kind of flatlining, uh, with the past two years reflecting the COVID, I think, um, showing a little dip down. So we'll talk about, I guess, the uh, three most common reasons for an allo transplant. Once again, allo transplant being one from a donor. So for AML, uh, patients that get diagnosed um, under, uh, undergo a battery of testing on their bone marrow biopsy at diagnosis. And uh, we're basically uh, trying to determine their risk score, or their prognostic scores. This is based on their uh, genetic uh, molecular markers, if you will. Uh, for the intermediate group and the poor risk group, um, patients uh, that have that characteristic uh, usually are um, considered to be um, uh, transplant uh, patients um, because the transplant hopefully will improve their chances of a cure. Uh, for the favorable group, uh, usually normal doses of uh, chemo induction consolidation will cure them probably about 70% of the time. Intermediate group, maybe about 40 to 50. Uh, poor group, maybe 10 to 20 at the best with uh, normal doses. Uh, and so uh, the intent of the transplant, once again, is for cure. And um, we would prefer if uh, the transplant is, occurs uh, when the patient has obtained a remission. So in general, 5% or less blast, um, but the better control, the better the results. For myelodysplastic syndrome, myeloproliferative neoplasm, very similar to AML. You can, I usually kind of consider that like a pre-AML. So uh, also you get a prognostic score and you classify them into groups. And uh, also transplant is for curative intent. Um, these patients, uh, when they go to a uh, the transplant, I think uh, most 
transplant doctors, as long as their disease is adequately, adequately controlled and not evolved into leukemia, we proceed uh, forward. Uh, but there is a graph I'll show later on, which may suggest that, that might, we might need to tighten that up a little bit. And then lastly, ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, once again, um, prognosing them at a diagnosis with the biopsy, uh, curative intent, uh, if they're in the medium or poor group, and then trying to transplant them in a remission. For ALO, we try to transplant even a little bit tighter, meaning that we would like to achieve the minimal residual disease prior to the transplant, uh, because there's data showing with minimal residual disease uh, with transplant, the risk of relapse is much greater than not. So uh, this is what a patient would go through. So um, when they see Dr. Mallory, Dr. Stevens, uh, doc, they would do the biopsy, and as we're waiting for those results to figure out what their prognosis is, uh, they would be getting their induction therapy. About four to six weeks later, they recover uh, another biopsy to see where they stand. Um, during that time, uh, the results from the first biopsy should come back uh, to uh, point us to see if they are uh, high risk enough to proceed with an ALO. Uh, usually the transplant uh, patient is referred to us. Uh, we evaluate them and we uh, educate them and see if they are willing to go through the process. Uh, doing an ALO transplant is like a job. Um, I think usually when I uh, counsel the patients, I tell them, a good six months to a, maybe a year of their life, they need to be really dedicated to this process. Um, it is, a, um, it is um, hopefully worth it at the end. Um, once everything's um, agreed upon, uh, we draw blood and we look for a donor. Uh, that could take, at quickest, maybe four to six weeks, but usually maybe a month or two, especially if there's no relatives identified. Uh, in the meantime, as we're doing the background work on the searching, um, the primary oncologist would uh, continue to treat the patient, consolidate them, and hopefully keep them in a remission. Uh, once the donor is identified, uh, then everything kind of comes together at the point where we uh, do the heart test, lung test to make sure the patient's fine, and we talk about doing uh, the actual transplant with the chemotherapy, and then um, usually in the hospital for 30 days and then out uh, with two twice a week following um, uh, the hospital discharge for a good two or three months. Um, we're specifically monitoring for complications. The two most common would be infections and a very specific uh, complication called graft-versus-host disease, uh, which is related to allotransplants. And then hopefully when they're in a remission, all the problems from transplant are taken care of. I can then discharge them back to Dr. Malley and Dr. Stevens. But I do tend to keep the patients a little longer than most, so I apologize. Uh, so the search is really the most important thing um, because without a donor, um, there is no transplant for an allo. That's what's going to fix the problem. Uh, so the search, uh, and I'm not a bench person or a scientific person by any means, but uh, we're using what we call uh, HLA. And so I envision that as um, blood cells, uh, there's hundreds of little markers called HLA markers, and there's uh, six specific ones. Um, that we're trying to match the patient to their donor. And if, they're, uh, if, they, if they match, then that would be appropriate and we would then move on. But this is the part that could take a few weeks, especially if there's no relatives. Um, we'll go through in a second the different types of um, donors, but I think um, the group in uh, Hopkins um, in, in the uh, 2000s uh, re really revolutionized transplant. At least I think this is the, one of the biggest advancements in the field uh, when they um, discovered how to use half-match relatives and to use uh, cytoxin as a uh, post-transplant medication to, um, to minimize the risk of graft versus host disease. The problem with using half half Really, uh, half match uh, donors in the past was you put the cells in, they recover, but when the uh, bone marrow and the stem cells um, um, fully recover, you get rip roaring, GVHD, uh, life threatening. And so the group um, in Hopkins experimented with uh, post transplant cytoxin after transplant. And now the graft versus host disease using a half uh, match donor or haplotransplant is comparable to um, full matches. Um, 
we think, and I think uh, they theorize that, um, you know, that cytoxin kills uh, off um, the, the T cells that causes GVHD, but it does not affect the other cells because they have um, inherent, uh, I think, high levels or are able to make uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase, which helps process the cytoxin. And so those cells then um, don't have the uh, lethal effects. So this has revolutionized, I think, transplant in that people couldn't get transplant in the past. Um, now they could, uh, as long as they have siblings, cousins, maybe even parents. So their donor field has broadened quite a bit just with this discovery. So um, this slide was kind of previously uh, seen, but these are the different types of transplant donors. Uh, you have the best, which would be a match-related donor. That's a full sibling. It's one out of four chance. This is all based on genetics. So uh, combination, you know, we all both get uh, um, genes from mom and dad. So one out of four chance that your siblings is going to be the same. Uh, the other uh, second tier donor is a match unrelated donor. This is a uh, volunteer donor that I've signed up and they might match the person, but it might be like a one in a million, one in a very astronomical odds but there's millions of people throughout the world that I've signed up, so it's the numbers that help the patients in that respect. The third group of uh, tier is what we had mentioned, uh, related donors that are half matches. Um, and one of the reasons also besides the cytoxin is that, you know, even though we test for the six uh, locus, um, because they're related, there might be other areas of the cells that are similar that we don't test, and that might um, allow for tolerance of the, um, the stem cells or the donor cells. Um, if they don't have the three above, then we start looking at um, cord blood, which has really fallen out of favor because uh, haplotransplants really taken over that, um, and that segment of the uh, donor source. And then lastly, uh, mismatch unrelated uh, donors or, or even mismatch related donors, which are people that don't exactly match all six. They might be missing one or two, and we may uh, have to um, uh, escalate their GVHD um, prophylaxis. So uh, each time you go down a tier, the risk of uh, potentially GVH goes up. Uh, I would say by single digits each time you go down. Um, engraftment sometimes can be affected. Uh, and engraftment meaning the time it takes to recover their cells. Uh, so the higher the tier, the better. Uh, but we don't always get what we want. So uh, this is um, a trend. And uh, I, I think the, okay, so I'm sorry. So I'll just last slide. So the haplo, uh, you can see um, everything is pretty non-existent, but in 2014, uh, it, there's a big shoot, uh, uh, increase. Um, everything else I would say is pretty uh, consistent in terms of the number. Um, cord blood, you can see, uh, really took a dive uh, once the haplo started getting uh, more popularized. So I had more slides, but they're all about just like transplant mortality, morbidity. Uh, the baseline is um, for all the transplants for allo, uh, morbidity, mortality is improving, the patients are doing better, and I, I think that's based on um, better supportive care. Yeah, we hear a lot about um, CAR-T and uh, transplant. I did have one question for you before we uh, move to the next topic. Do you, do you anticipate a circumstance where perhaps you use like uh, an, a, a consolidative auto followed by a consolidative CAR-T effort? And do you hear about that in your uh, transplant circles? Yes, so um, I think you know, CAR-T cell has also revolutionized um, at least lymphoma care for now. Uh, and certainly uh, the algorithm between transplant and CAR-T cell, I think we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, the question Dr. Malley asked, I think is something that we're trying to figure out um, if it is effective or not. So I personally don't have a good answer for that. I know that for CAR T cell regimens, um, if people get chemo um, and it doesn't work, then definitely uh, CAR T cell. Um, for ALL, we know that sometimes, uh, at least in the initial ALL CAR T cells, uh, patients went through CAR T cell and they end up getting a transplant as a consolidation. So I think the the schema right now is not clear, uh, CAR T cell being relatively new, um, but I could certainly see an interplay between both in the near future. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chow. Sorry we're out of, ran out of time. Thank you Appreciate for your attention. It. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, Dr. Chow.
Our next speaker doesn't really need an uh, introduction, I'm sure, but I'll give him one anyway. This is uh, Dr. Don Stevens. He is the director of our hematologic malignancy program at Norton Cancer Institute. Um, undergraduate work, uh, Georgetown, Kentucky, uh, medical degree and residency at the University of Louisville, fellowship at uh, Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, and then came back to Louisville to work as a faculty member at U of L and served um, on the BMT service there. Um, but then back in 1994, when the rest of us were watching Forrest Gump and uh, Shawshank Redemption in the theater, you joined Norton Healthcare, thankfully, yes, yes. and have grown the program to where it is today. Um, and so we're happy here to have Dr. Stevens to present our next topic, initial treatment options for patients with multiple myeloma. Thank you, Dr. Malley. Great to be with you today. And again, I'd like to echo what Dr. Malley said about uh, so glad that you guys could make it. This is a very exciting topic. Uh, things have really changed a great deal since just a few short decades ago I started this uh, because uh, we really had, uh, Dr. Hadley can attest to this, we really had Alcoran and prednisone. We would have these in-depth discussions about do you give it for four weeks and two weeks off or three weeks on and three weeks. I mean, all of this, you know, dealing with the two drugs that we had for myeloma, and clearly that landscape has changed a great deal. One of the reasons that it has is because of the, the support that has been given to research, especially uh, the leadership here at Norton's, Dr. Flynn, Dr. Wyatt, our great research team uh, sitting there in the back. Uh, it has been amazing to witness the development of all the new pharmaceutical drugs that we have for the treatment of a newly diagnosed myeloma. Let's see, do I do this? Yes, I have no thing to disclose. The objectives would be to determine when therapy should be initiated. That's important because this disease is one with a rather heterogeneous course, and you do not wish to expose someone to the at least inconvenience, if not the toxicities, of antineoplastic therapy until we feel that that's absolutely necessary and is going to be to their benefit. We want to be able to risk stratify patients. This is something relatively new across all of oncology, but it really does, I think, represent the future in, to be able to, in being able to design specific therapy for patients. We're still learning what factors are important. It's also very important, I will get to this when we review a paper here in a moment, it's very important to understand that risk factors are only valid in the context of the available therapies. What I mean by that is a molecular marker that might be important when we're talking about Alcoran and prednisone may be less important when we're talking about bispecific T-cell engaging monoclonal antibody therapy. And lastly, to be able to choose therapy based on the patient's disease, the patient's goals, the patient's overall health, and the disease characteristics. So I, the way I would summarize that is to say that choice is great, choosing wisely, however, can be a challenge. I don't often talk about what I'm not gonna talk about, but these are all very important topics that really, uh, due to time constraints, I would not be able to uh, review with you the initial treatment of these things. I would refer the curious to the NCCN guidelines which are obviously quite great in this regard. I wanted to spend a moment, everyone here I'm sure is familiar with CRAB. Literally for decades we waited until there was end organ damage before beginning the therapy of multiple myeloma. About 10 years ago we realized that you can define findings that put patients in a similar group before they get end organ damage. Also to, to deal with the second or the, the bottom half of the slide first, the so-called CRAB acronym, these, there are precise definitions that helps us and guides us in when to initiate therapy. It's not just that the calcium's up a little bit or 0.2 or 0.1. We might, might want to make note of that, we might want to follow that, but that does not meet the criteria by the International Myeloma Working Group for hypercalcemia. Renal insufficiency I find personally to be one of the most daunting criteria to use because patients come to us with many other reasons they have chronic kidney disease, hypertension, diabetes being the two most common. And then to talk about SLIM, the top part of the slide here, patients who have 60% plasma cells in their bone marrow essentially have the same natural history as someone with hypercalcemia, renal failure, et cetera. So those patients get included. And then if we divide the involved light chains by the uninvolved light chains and get a ratio of 100, uh, that is also a criteria in the SLIM crab. We don't often use MRI in Louisville much, but that is also part of this criteria. If we are using that, it's you know, one or more five millimeter lesion on MRI in the bone. So next to talk about what, can, what factors are currently considered high risk. Uh, this is a changing, and again, I'm gonna review a paper here in a second. This is a very changing landscape. 
it, the translocations 4, 14, 14, 16, and the deletion of 17P are the three that are commonly used or the ones that are really entered into this criteria first. Other risk factors, again, I'm going to go through some of this quickly, is uh, high-risk gene-expressing profiling. We seldom do that. The presence of extra medullary disease or plasmacytomas in soft tissues is obviously a high-risk category. Any circulating plasma cell count greater than 5% is considered high risk, uh, obviously renal failure, and then anything that suggests horrible uh, marrow compromise such as thrombocytopenia, lymphopenia. Immunoparesis is a state where you're, the body is making so much of the paraprotein, so much of the abnormal immunoglobulin or light chain that's not capable of making normal IgG, normal IgA, normal IgM, and that state is called immunoparesis. That seems to have an impact on patients' risk even in the absence of infections. Uh, so that, again, says something about how severely the myeloma is compromising the patient's immune system. This is the international staging system. On the left a part of the slide, you'll see the older system that was basically just divided into three, one, two, and three. Patients and their families often ask how we stage myeloma. It is relatively easy. This was designed basically so that you could stage someone based on two blood tests, the beta-2 microglobulin and the albumin. As we begin to incorporate other high-risk features, that's where the revised ISS comes in. They're often listed, and this is taken from the NCCN, they're often listed side by side because you really need the ISS in order to determine what the revised ISS is. In the interest of time, I'm not going to spend quite so much on that. So there is now, uh, we're beginning to realize, a group of patients that have ultra high risk, which sounds as bad as it is. Again, this is all part of our evolution of what is high risk. This is a publication from last month in Blood, looking at the biallelic deletion of 1P32 and really defines this high risk. If you have a monoallelic or one allele deleted from the 1P32, it's bad. If you have both, it's even worse. And this study was really designed to look at what the significance of that was. And the authors at the end of the paper concluded, and I think you will agree when you look at the data, that this should be included in the revised ISS are certainly reviewed and included in what defines high risk from the International Working Group. This was a study of 2,551 patients. They were diagnosed from 2010 to 2021. Again, that matters because in the, in the teens, we really didn't have bispecific T-cell engaging monoclonal antibody therapy, and that's going to impact whether or not something is an adverse risk factor or not. All of these patients were followed for at least 36 months. Um, or died or progressed within 36 months. These are the patient characteristics. Again, won't go through all of this. If you'll look at, though, at this group of patients, 2,500 patients, about 280 of them had deletion of 1P32. And again, that means 2,269 did not. All of the other net characteristics are listed here. And I think in the interest of time, we will not spend a whole lot of time on this except to say this was also, a, again, a population that already has other predefined high-risk characteristics, including the translocation 1416 um, and the TP53 mutation. The one thing I will point out in this, and frankly, a lot of the myeloma literature, is that it excludes about half the patients. Depending on what series and whether you're talking U.S. or Europe, the median age of myeloma at diagnosis is in the mid-60s to as high as 70 some series as low as 60. But regardless, if you, obviously if you have inclusion exclusion criteria at 65, you're eliminating half or close to half of the patients with the disease. So we're really just studying the youngest half of the myeloma population. And I think that's important to point out. So these curves I think are pretty shocking. In the left, you'll see the overall survival of newly diagnosed myeloma patients irrespective of treatment. And you'll see in the blue line at the top that there was no deletion of 1P32. The red line are patients who had a deletion of 1P32. On the right panel, you'll see that if you had both copies deleted, in other words, a biallelic deletion of 1P32, that's the red line at the bottom. The median survival in that patient population, regardless of treatment, was less than two years. On the other hand, if you did not have any deletion of 1P32, regardless of what else was going on, your survival was over 10 years. 
So a huge prognostic value, at least again, within the context of therapy from 2010 to 2021. I wanted to show you, this is uh, from Dr. Christensen's group at CPA. This is our FISH panel that we currently do at Norton Healthcare for newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. And I will call, I don't think I have a pointer, I'll call your attention to the third one up from the bottom, which is a 1P32. So this is something we are looking at already within our FISH panel. This is one particular gene. There are actually several genes on that locus of 1P, but the uh, the fact is that we are still, I think, ahead of the curve in terms of looking at myeloma fish. This is a slide from a last summer from blood looking at a how I treat article for high-risk myeloma. Again, in the interest of time, I won't go into too many details here, except to say that this is a population that uh, I think most of us agree, and I know that Dr. Malley and I agree, that if you have defined, if you're fit, uh, if you've defined to have a high risk, that we really think this is some, a group that should have four drug therapy with a monoclonal antibody therapy such as daratumumab in addition to the usual triplet that we use. And this is true for fit patients who are not headed to transplant or patients who are headed to transplant. Wanted to talk a little bit about uh, transplant and bone marrow transplant for just a few minutes. This is a study published in uh, July of last year in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was similar to the study that Dr. Christensen has already alluded to. Uh, however, in this study, the maintenance therapy was indefinite and not for one year. In the study published in, from Europe and France, the uh, definition or the, or the defined period of maintenance therapy after transplant was just for one year. And in the U.S. Uh, group were 56 different sites across the United States. Again, accrued patients from 2010 to 2018, and they had maintenance lenalidomide uh, until progression. We think of lines of therapy in myeloma, and the initial or frontline therapy includes induction therapy, then includes for patients that are fit and that is appropriate for autologous stem cell that Dr. Chow mentioned, and then consolidation, usually using and repeating the same therapy we used for induction, and that's followed by a maintenance therapy. And that's all considered one line of therapy. When we do clinical trials for myeloma that involve patients who have to have had three lines, for example, then even though it might seem like that patient has been exposed to three different treatments, we consider that the first line of therapy. Again, this uh, maybe doesn't project real well, but wanted to point out this again, 56 sites across the US, 18 to 65 years old. So again, we're dealing with the youngest half of the myeloma population. They enrolled, in, and those of us that do clinical trials are aware of these numbers, they actually enrolled 873 patients, uh, or they recruited 873 patients. They only were able to enroll 729, and they randomized 722. Again, this may not project well, but just wanted to tell you that we're talking about lines of therapy. These patients were randomized after they had had uh, some exposure to chemotherapy already with a three-drug regimen. They were randomized to either get a transplant or don't get a transplant. Of the 365 patients that were randomized to get a transplant, only 310 didn't. So 55 patients that were randomized for a variety of reasons to get transplant did not. 357 patients had RVD alone. And if you'll just go to the bottom here, at the, at the end of this, 261 patients in the RVD alone were alive, 273 after transplant. There were 90 deaths in the no transplant arm, 88 deaths in the transplant arm. These are the baseline characteristics for the RVD alone, plus transplant, again, won't, the median age. All of these characteristics were equally randomized or equally uh, between the two groups. There were not a great difference. About 20% of this population was considered high risk by the standards from 2010. And these are the, these are the graphs. This is the progression-free survival. This is uh, the graph that would support the use of autologous transplant in myeloma. The, delay in progression is significant. However, if you look at overall survival, there's no difference. The reason for that, of course, is that we now have many second, third line therapies for myeloma that we can use in patients after they fail to respond. So if someone is randomized to RVD alone, for example, they were, their overall survival was not affected. 
they may have had to go on to second line therapy sooner. In fact, many of the patients in this particular study went on to have an autologous transplant as part of their second line therapy. But we can tell someone today, based on this data and based on the previous data published from Europe, that having a transplant for myeloma is not going to impact your survival, but may give you a longer first remission. As far as toxicities go, they are what you would expect for patients going through transplant. Both quality of life and assessment of global health was diminished immediately after transplant. That effect went away, as Dr. Chow said. That effect goes away after several months, and the quality of life really normalizes between the two groups. But at least initially, you can't go through an, even an autologous transplant, even if you try to do it as an outpatient, without some compromise in your quality of life. wanted to talk a little bit about duration of response, and this is why the curves are different. Uh, to go to the median duration of partial response or better in months, without the transplant, it's 38 months. With the transplant, it's 56. And that's why that progression-free survival curve varied as it did. If you look at patients that had a complete response or better uh, at five years, it was 50% for the RVD alone and 60% for the transplant group. And if you look at disease progression events, uh, again, there were, there were just a few more in the non-transplant arm than in the transplant arm. I'm not going to go through all the NCCN. I will refer you to the, N e the I NCCN guidelines for uh, initial therapy. I did want to point out a couple of things with what could be considered preferred regimens. VRD is one I think that most people will agree is our preferred regimen. Uh, we are now using more weekly uh, Velcade instead of biweekly Velcade. The reason for that is there's less neurotoxicity and you actually are able to deliver a more effective overall dose doing that. The partial response or better rate is nearly 100%. The CR rate's 52. There are some very good alternatives for individuals that have difficulty with peripheral neuropathy or for other reasons you want to make a substitution. Kyprolis, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone is one of those, again, with a very high CR rate. Cyborg D, the CR rate is not as high, but still very effective. And there are clinical trials looking at Cyborg D pre-transplant with some very good CR uh, and some very good effectiveness. We typically reserve Cyborg D for individuals that we don't think are going to tolerate an effective dose of lenalidomide due to renal disease. I wanted to next talk about uh, one of our clinical trials, our current uh, Norton Cancer Institute clinical trial for newly diagnosed multiple myeloma is shown here. This is the CARTITUDE 5 study. It is a phase three study of VRD and siltacaptogene autolucil versus VRD in newly diagnosed patients not headed to transplant. So again, this is a group of patients that either because they elect not to have a transplant or we feel that transplant is not in their best interest, they undergo a pre-randomization treatment of six cycles of VRD. At the end of that six cycles, they are then randomized to arm A, which is to continue VRD for two additional cycles, or arm B, two additional cycles of VRD, while we are then collecting cells to develop an autologous CAR-T product. The patients on the arm without the CAR-T go on to what would be considered standard therapy for individuals not going to transplant, which is you finish induction and you go on to lenalidomide dexamethasone maintenance. If you have a CAR-T product, you get that cell infused, and then you go on to uh, follow up without maintenance. So again, this is a clinical trial. This should reach accrual sometime this year. And we've been very excited to have this a trial to offer to our patients. Uh, next, you'll, uh, I would like to do a real quick question. This is not really audience response, but you have to think about it regardless. The question is, match these famous pathologists to their quote. Pathologist number one, pathologist number two, pathologist number three. And I, the, where this question comes from, one of my favorite um, uh, board questions uh, just two or three years ago, or decades ago when I was taking my boards, was a very cool question where it had photomicrographs of peripheral blood films on one side and karyotypic abnormalities on the other. So you had to diagnose from the peripheral blood and then match that with the chromosome abnormalities. And I, that, for whatever reason, that question stuck in my mind. So when I wanted to include a somewhat humorous, at least I hope you find somewhat humorous, a question to finish this talk, uh, I, I came up with this. So the, the quotes are antibody antigen. So which pathologist discovered or first wrote about the term antibody antigen? Which pathologist said all cells come from cells? And which pathologist said CD45 has never let me down? Well, I'll give you some clues. Uh, the antibody antigen was published in 1891. 
The All Cells Come From Cells was from a publication in 1855, and the CD45 never let me down was uttered last week over the phone to me. <laughs> if you need additional clues, I will tell you that one of these pathologists is considered the father of modern pathology. One is considered and associated with what was termed the magic bullet, and one was a med school classmate of mine. So here's, here's the matchup. Dr. Al Martin has said on more than one occasion, right, Dr. Christensen? Yes, CD45 has never let him down. Uh, I've, I've, I've included this on purpose because the, uh, our hematology malignancy program would not be what it is without our colleagues in pathology. Uh, they sometimes don't get enough credit. Uh, but under uh, Dr. Martin's uh, leadership, they have become a regional resource. Our, pen our patients benefit daily from their knowledge and skill set. I have an unalloyed appreciation for their role in our program and our patient care. And I can't thank them enough. A summary. Uh, I really, obviously, I really think that we all need to be using the International Myeloma Working Group criteria for starting therapy. We need to consider disease-specific factors in determining the best initial therapy, and the role of autotransplant, I think, is evolving. I think it is still there, but we still have some, uh, we still have some definitions and, and to define the best patients for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Stevens? Where'd you get that picture of Dr. Martin? From my Apache med school teacher. Ah, awesome. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. All right. And for our last talk for session one, uh, next we have um, Dr. Kaylee Pagan. Uh, she is currently a, a clinical pharmacy specialist at the Norton Cancer Institute. She completed her PGY2 oncology residency with us at Norton Cancer Institute and did her uh, got her doctorate of pharmacology at the University of Florida. Go Gators. Um, so with uh, no further ado, Dr. Pagan. Thank you, everyone. Today we're going to be talking about new therapies for multiple myeloma. I am, in the interest of time, going to try to make this as brief and educational as possible for you all. I have nothing to disclose. And before we get started, I just want to let you know a little bit about what the plan is for today. We're going to summarize the benefit of targeted therapy in multiple myeloma discuss three FDA-approved therapies for the management of multiple myeloma, and then review a couple novel mechanisms currently be eva being evaluated even here at NCI. So multiple myeloma, it's not a new disease state, as you've learned today. It's a malignant neoplasm of plasma cells accumulating in the bone marrow. And the first well-documented case was really in 1844. It took about 30 years after that, though, before the term multiple myeloma was coined. It's estimated that in 2023, we'll see about 36,000 new cases, with that making up roughly 2% of all cancer cases and roughly 20% of all heme malignancies. The five-year relative survival rate for these patients is around 60%, and the median age at diagnosis is somewhere around 65 to 74. Now, with this timeline, I want to point out that we've come a long way in therapy. It's changed quite a bit over time. And this year, in 2023, we will actually be celebrating the 20th anniversary of Velcade, or Bortezomib's FDA approval. Uh, and even eight years ago, Darzalex was newly approved for the use um, in multiple myeloma as well in combination. Over these two decades, we've really seen substantial progress in how treatment modalities work. We've seen longer durations of complete response for patients, deeper responses, longer survival, but despite this, most patients will relapse, and multiple myeloma is still considered an incurable disease. Within the past few years, research has really focused on cellular therapies, as you've already heard today. And that's really going to be what we focus on today, is these cellular therapies and some of these new targets that we have available. So B-cell maturation antigen is a new target for multiple myeloma. It regulates B-cell proliferation, maturation, and survival. It helps ensure differentiation into plasma cells. It's found almost exclusively on plasma blast and plasma cells. And thus, anti-BCMA targeted therapy really promotes cytotoxic activity uh, against multiple myeloma cells, making it a very interesting uh, receptor to target. We're going to first talk about these BCMA-directed CAR-T therapies that we've talked briefly about earlier today. Idacaptogene, Viclusol, or Idacel as well as silcaptogene, autolusol, 
or Siltacel, were both FDA approved within the past couple of years for relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. Idacaptogene was approved based on the KARMA trial. This was a phase one, two trial uh, that looked at patients um, in this relapsed refractory setting who'd received three or more prior lines of treatment. The median number of prior lines for these patients was roughly six. They utilized three different dosing levels within this trial that we won't get into today just for the sake of time. But they found that the overall response rate was roughly 72% with a complete response around 30%. And patients in those higher dosing schemes actually remained in CR for at least 12 months. The median progression-free survival was 8.8 .8 months for these patients. However, with the highest dosing level, patients had progression-free survival for roughly a year. Cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity are two things that we deal with very commonly with CAR-T-directed therapies and these new cellular therapy agents. Cytokine release syndrome occurred in about 84% of patients, with only 5%, though, seeing grade 3 or higher. Neurotoxicity, like ICANs, like I mentioned, also occurred in about 20% of patients. However, only four patients had grade three or higher, leading this to be a safe and effective regimen for patients that provided durable response in heavily pretreated patients. Siltacaptogene also was FDA approved, as I mentioned, in the CARTITUDE trial. They looked at patients who had at least three prior lines of treatment in the trial. The median number of trial um, treatments prior was six, so very similar to the KARMA trial. And as you can tell here, overall response rate was roughly 97% with stringent CR or stringent complete response at 67%, with 12-month 12 12 progression-free survival at about 77%. The CARTITUDE 1 trial really demonstrated wonderful benefits for patients, and it was successful. You can see there's discussion nowadays on which one is better for patients. We do have a couple updated studies that were recently published, so I do want to touch base on the KARMA 3 trial, which was published in March, so just a few months ago, just last month. This was a phase 3 trial looking at patients with two to four prior lines who'd previously received an IMID proteasome inhibitor or anti-CD38 directed therapy, so daratumumab, an ECOG score of zero to one with measurable disease. Patients were randomized to either IDASEL at various dosing schemes or standard of care therapy, which you see on this slide. As you can tell, a majority of these patients had had multiple lines of therapy, roughly about three, time since their diagnosis was around four, and high-risk cytogenetics occurred in about 40 to 50% of patients. These were heavily retreated pre-treated patients, as you can tell, and even 80% of patients had had prior auto stem cell transplants. On the right side of the screen, I want to point out the results of this study. So the median progression-free survival was 13.3 months in the IDA cell group versus 4.4 months in the standard of care arm. It is amazing to see that patients had such a long response being so heavily pretreated and knowing that with these patients who go to auto transplant immediately after their induction therapy, we're only extending the amount of time that they have in this um, treatment free period. Overall response was 71% in the IDASEL arm, standard of care 42%. Median duration of response, what I think is very important here in the IDASEL arm, was roughly 15 months, meaning that these patients experienced treatment and all of the lymphodepleting chemotherapy and processes that go along with that initial treatment, but went for almost 13 months without, 13 to 14 months without needing any additional treatments, just regular monitoring and follow-up. The adverse events were very similar to the KARMA trial, and we currently have a CARTITUDE 5 that Dr. Stevens mentioned, as well as a CARTITUDE 4 trial looking at these, this treatment regimen and earlier lines of therapy, meaning that more patients may be able to see these long-term results sooner in their treatment. One of the things that I think is important, especially as a pharmacist, is to think about the other considerations for use. These medications have a heavy cost burden associated with them, so financial toxicities are something we really have to worry about, not just for the patient, but for the healthcare system themselves. There are a lot of different things that go into making sure that these are successful therapies, not just the cost associated with the hospitalization, the outpatient management, but also access to treatment for these medications. The facilities have to be enrolled in REMS programs due to those risks of CRS and ICANS, so it is important to ensure that patients and healthcare providers are aware of this when we're trying to determine the next therapy available. Product availability is also something that we really have to worry about here. When IDASEL first came to market, there was actually a bottleneck effect because the viral vector that's used to form these CAR T cells 
had gone on, um, had become in short supply, like many of the shortages we're experiencing in pharmacy today. What that meant is that patients who would have been eligible for this in the commercial setting but may not have been eligible in the studies are not being able to be treated because we do not have the product. A lot of these issues have been kind of worked out or we're working towards those goals, but it's definitely something to consider when we're thinking about CAR-T for patients as it increases in popularity. Another exciting agent that I want to talk about is teclistamab, which was FDA approved in October 2022 with an accelerated approval. This is a bispecific antibody targeting CD3 and BCMA. Thinking about bispecific antibodies, the last one that we really had FDA approved and readily available was blinitumumab that came with a lot of complications and dosing strategies. So it's exciting to see something as a sub-Q formulation that's available for patients readily. This is indicated for adult patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma who've received four prior lines of therapy. And this is based on the Majestic 1 trial, a phase 1-2 study that looked at patients with three prior lines, exposure to those IMIDs, proteasome inhibitors, and anti-CD38 um, therapies, had an ECOG of 0 to 1, measurable disease, and no prior BCMA-targeted therapies. Patients received a step-up dosing with teclistamab in patients with pre-medications as appropriate, and then were subsequently given teclistamab 1.5 mg per kg sub-Q once weekly, cycles 1 and beyond. This was continued until patients' disease progressed. The primary endpoints that they looked at were overall response rate, which we'll talk about on the next slide, as well as duration of response and then how durable that response was with very good um, partial response, complete response, or time to that response as well. The baseline characteristics are listed on this slide as well, but as you can see, these were heavily high pre-treated patients once again, median prior number of therapies being five, with triple class refractory disease and typically a prior auto stem cell transplant. The Majestic One results, which I think are the most exciting part about this um, portion of the talk, the median follow-up time was 14.1 months for these patients. Their median dur duration of treatment was 8.5 months. Median time to first response was 1.2 months, so roughly two cycles in, we're already starting to see people um, achieve these responses we need them to receive, with the median best time to response at 3.8 months. The duration of this response, which I think is the most exciting if you think about the five prior lines majority of these patients had received, was 18.4 months, over a year of benefit from receiving teclistamab. The duration of the pro progression-free survival was roughly 11, or I apologize for the typo, the median progression-free survival was 11.3 months, and as you can tell on the right-hand side, the overall response rate for these patients, which I think is very exciting, um, was roughly 60% and that are 63% with a majority of patients or over half achieving a complete response at 39.4%. Now this does come with some side effects that I think are important to mention, but in comparison to other therapies that patients have received, they are, I think, very manageable. Uh, hematologic malignancies, I think, come with almost any therapy that we give patients within multiple myeloma. Um, so neutropenias, anemias, thrombocytopenias, we know how to manage these. However, looking at CRS and neurotoxicity, which are also important things to consider within our um, bispecific therapies, uh, occurred in roughly 70% for CRS and then 14% in for neurotoxicity, with, less than, with only one patient in each of those arms receiving grade three reactions. Infection is one thing that I think is important to consider. There was a high rate of hypogamma globulinemia in these patients, which is to be expected with bispecific therapy. It is important when we're thinking about these patients just to make sure we're monitoring for hypogamma globulinemia and those neutropenias to make sure that we're preventing infections as appropriate. Things to consider here is access to treatment once again. So because of those risks of cytokine release syndrome and ICANS or neurotoxicity, we do have a REMS program enrolled. We are one of the first facilities in Kentucky to actually be enrolled in this REMS program and have successfully treated eight patients since January of this year. So we're very excited to be a part of these patients' journey and looking through these durable responses. One of the benefits here is, though, that it's not dependent on our patient's own cells. One thing that I didn't mention with the CARTITUDE-1 and the KARMA trials is there are a few patients who didn't receive therapy because once they were leukophoresed for treatment, they actually did not meet those dosing criteria required in order to be on study. 
That is unfortunate because these patients put a lot of eggs in a basket hoping for treatment and hoping for some type of response. And then to be told, well, we did everything we could, we harvested your cells, but unfortunately it wasn't good enough, is very disappointing not only as a you know, pharmacist and a clinical provider for these patients, but also for those patients who've got a lot of hope in this. The dosing schedule is another thing to consider. These patients have been heavily pretreated and are used to coming to the clinic multiple times per week. However, they do have to come at least weekly for ticlistamab. It is, once again, dosed once weekly, which can be a burden on patients who maybe live far away from your REM certified center. So making sure that patients are aware of this is important, but also ensuring that we're providing that support, whatever it may be outside of clinical support, social, social workers and transportation are very important. There are future studies with um, teclistamab seeing about alternative dosing strategies like every other week dosing. And the hope is that we see benefit there and can hopefully provide these patients a little bit of less time in the clinic because I'm sure they're looking forward to that. On the horizon, so a couple of things that I just want to talk about here, um, looking towards the future and what's currently in the pipeline. I know that's what we're always looking for is what are we going to do next. I'm going to talk briefly about one drug that we were able to bring into, help bring into market or hopefully in the future come to market, but first I want to talk about what the target is. So GPRC5D or G protein coupled receptor class C group 5 member D, thank goodness for acronyms, is a novel target that preferentially is expressed on plasma cells. It's independent of the BCMA expression and overexpression in the bone marrow is actually associated with poor prognosis for these patients. It is seen on normal tissue sites, so for instance, the skin, which means that we can have on-target, off-tumor effect. When we're looking at side effect profile in the next slide, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But currently, it's being evaluated as a target for both CAR-T, bispecific antibodies that we talked about like today, as well as tri-specific antibodies for patients with multiple myeloma. Talquetamab is the first-in-class agent for bispecific antibodies targeting CD3 along with GPRC5D receptors. So similar to our teclistamab, this engages T cells but actually targets this GPRC5D as a new way of helping to promote cytotoxic effects within these multiple myeloma cells. It has received breakthrough therapy designation from the FDA, however, they are still under application for FDA approval. This is all based on the monumental one trial. Really quickly, I just want to talk about this is a phase one, two trial looking at patients who had progressive disease, three or more prior lines, triple class refractory, I'd seen triple classes, and patients were randomized to a weekly dosing scheme and every other week dosing scheme, and then they subcategorized patients who had prior T cell redirection group. They did also allow patients to have BCMA targeted therapies in the past which is very beneficial to see how this looks at patients and in the future maybe where this aligns with our other therapies currently available. As you can tell on the left-hand side, the overall response rate I think is something that's really amazing here and something to be excited about. Roughly 75% of patients or over 70% in both the weekly and every other week group um, saw some response, very good um, partial response was common along with the stringent complete response, roughly about 20% for each group. This is wonderful. Think about how heavily pretreated, once again, these patients were with roughly six or seven lines of therapy prior to treatment, and we're seeing long-term results that are occurring very quickly for patients. On the other hand, you can see the, on the other side of this screen, you can also see some of the side effects that came along with it. Those off on-target off-tumor effects that I mentioned are represented by these skin-related AEs, nail-related AEs, as long with their rash. And these were pretty substantial for patients. We did experience that a lot when we were a part of this clinical trial. Um, but they are manageable for patients, so really working with them to make sure that we're supporting them in the best way possible is key to helping for the success for this drug. Other mechanisms that I want to quickly touch on here at NCI that we have available is MM2049. This is a phase 1B clinical trial with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma utilizing eftazanamib alpha. This is a trail receptor antagonist. So that is a tumor necrosis factor related apoptosis inducing ligand, if you were wondering what trail stood for. It induced induced apoptosis in cancer cells by actually activating death receptors 4 and 5 without toxicity in our normal cells. And then another trial that we are looking at today, um, looking at is MM2050. This is a phase 1 first in human multicenter open label two-part dose escalation 
of ISB 1342. ISB 1342 co-engages CD3 along with CD38. It actually um, is thought to be able to help with daratumumab resistance in patients with multiple myeloma, providing another opportunity for patients with these cellular therapies. This is everything that I have today, quite a mouthful to get through. Any questions that you guys have for me?